they're okay, loved ones. Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 1, it says this. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. That's your real life. Not what's going on here right now, guys. Okay? Get your eyes set on the realities of heaven where Christ sits at the right hand of the Father. Don't get your eyes set on CNN and the polls and who's dying and who's living and all this stuff that you need and rushing to the store. That's the things of this earth. If you are truly a Christian, then, then to die, I mean, to live is to live for Christ, and to die is to gain, is to go to heaven. So listen, loved ones, we have nothing to fear, Amen. ever. Amen. If every one of us got that disease and died today, and I love you, and I wouldn't want you to be gone, but you'd get to be in heaven. Isn't that what we're all wanting? Yeah. Isn't that the beautiful reality that's before the Christ follower? So we have nothing to worry about. So set your eyes on the realities of heaven where Christ sits at the right hand of the Father. Okay, That's where your eyes, your focus needs to be. And when I look across this room and I see hardly anybody here, it's because the realities of the, of the earth, the realities of the things that are going on in front of us, the circumstances of our life are dictating what we say, what we do, where we go. And that is not what a Christ follower follows. The Christ follower, the, his or her life is run by what this says, not what circumstance says, okay? So, so listen, the kingdom of God, we've been talking a lot about the kingdom of God, okay? The kingdom of God, is, it says in Romans chapter 14, verse 17, it says the kingdom of God is not what we eat or drink, okay? It's not what we do. But it's a, it, the kingdom of God is, is, is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, right? That's what the kingdom of God is like. So let's get to our feet this morning. Like if, you, if Christ has gone to the cross for you and paid for your sin, do you have reason to be joyful? Right? If he has raised from the dead, conquering death forever for you and raised you to new life, do you have a reason to be joyful? Amen. All right, so let's get to our feet and let's invite. Listen, he said if you draw close to him, he'll draw close to you. So that's why we're here this morning, to draw close to the Lord. So let's do that. Let's invite him into our presence right now in a powerful way and enjoy the presence of God and worship him. We are forever grateful for that, Lord. We would only ask that you'd be here with us this morning in a powerful way, Lord. Your word teaches us that your Holy Spirit leads us into all truth, and that's really what we want this morning, Lord. We want your truth. We want to base our life upon it. So, Lord, give us ears to hear what you have to say to our church. Give us things that we can obey this morning. That's where your great blessing pours through the funnel of obedience. It's true that all things do work out for the good to those who love you and are called to your purpose. We want to be purpose-driven people this morning. Help identify for us why we've been saved and what we live for so we can live that out, Lord. That's the sweet spot of life. That is life in abundance, and that's what we want. That's what you came for, that we might have life in abundance. So help us to achieve that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, loved ones, love to hear your voice. I'm sure God loves to hear it even more. Um, hey, uh, repent and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. It's near. That's, what he, that's the way Jesus started out his, his ministry, right? He said that... Uh, it says that as he got done wandering through the wilderness, tempted by the enemy, that's what he started doing. He started going around preaching that message. Repent, turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And then he, when he's teaching us how to pray, he says that our desire should be this, that we should pray this, that your kingdom would come. Like, that's what I want, right? Your kingdom is near, and I want it to be near. That's what he's saying, right? 
I want it to be near. I want it to come. I want your will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. I want what goes on in heaven to be going on here. That's what God came for in the person of Jesus Christ. That's what we should desire, right? And uh, this kingdom we've been preaching about, and, and this morning will be the last uh, message in this series, and then I think we'll jump back into the book of Acts, unless God says something otherwise. But the kingdom is what we've been preaching you know, all these different things in the Bible, people make so much about them. You know, they're all important. Anything that's in the Bible is important. Do you understand, right? But, but, but we make a big thing about things that are only mentioned once or twice, you know? I have people that won't come to this church unless I tell them exactly what they want to hear about how the spiritual gifts are moving in this church. Like, do you know that the spiritual gifts are important? Did you know that? Yeah. I believe personally that they continue. But, listen, but listen, there's, there's very little mention of it in Scripture. Just a couple of verses, a few chapters. That doesn't mean it's not important. But you know that the kingdom is just dozens and dozens of times in all of the, in all of the Gospels and in the letters, the epistles, just mentioned over and over and over and over again in Scripture, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. And people don't talk much about the kingdom because a kingdom is, is by definition, a territory or a group of people that are under the sovereign rule of a monarch. And we're Americans. We don't like that. We left that back in England, right? We don't like being told what to do. We're Americans. But listen, Jesus came not to establish a kingdom, but to announce a kingdom that already was. Amen. He is the king. right? He is the sovereign monarch. What he says goes. Amen. And right now, the kingdom of heaven is in you, if you're a believer in Christ. Amen. Right, but someday the ki the kingdom's going to be in its fullness when when God when Jesus comes back and with his angels and they separate those who who are not bending the knee to Jesus' lordship and those who are and they're not going to be with us forever. They're going to a really bad place, and a lot of people don't like to talk about. I don't want to ruin your day, but those people go to hell. But the rest of those that bowed the knee to Christ, they get to shine in the kingdom of heaven forever. That's awesome, right? That's the fullness of the kingdom, and that's coming. So it's not just a people, but one day it'll be a territory as well, that this new heaven and this new earth will form, and Jesus will reign supreme there, and we will be there with him forever. That's a territory and a people ruled by a single sovereign. He didn't come to just create some religion he didn't come just to set up a church, although he says, I will build my church. That's true. But he came preaching a kingdom. And Jesus Christ said in Matthew 28 that all, let's, let's talk about a king here, right? Amen. All authority in heaven and in earth is mine. Amen. He is the king of the kingdom, right? And this is what he preaches, okay? Now, when there's a single sovereign ruler, that leaves no room for autonomy. We don't get to do things the way we want to. We don't get to do what seems right in your eyes. When everyone does what's right in their own eyes, there's actually a word for that. It's called anarchy. Right? There's no room for anarchy in a kingdom. Right? There's no room for that. What he says goes. Okay? So... I'm saying this because we've, I've got a message prepared, but before we go there, I have to address something. Like, we're here this morning, okay? Nobody likes us. Just go on Facebook. I've been, I've been you know, because I'm the preacher here, so, I'll, you know, I get all the brunt of it, but that's okay. I mean, I've been told I've been dwelled by Satan, that I should die. And that I should go to hell for having church this morning. Because we're supposed to obey the law of the land. Now the scriptures do say that. And the scriptures also say in Romans 13 that all authority, like our governments and stuff, is appointed by God. And if you resist the government, you're resisting what God does. 
I get that. So when it says 55 miles an hour, we should go 55 miles an hour. If it says we should pay our taxes, we should pay our taxes. Those aren't religious things. They're just the law of the land. But just because God authorizes all governmental authority, that doesn't mean that all governmental authority does the right thing all the time. Just like you Christian and me Christian, I have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of me. So in theory, in theory, I should do what's right all the time. I should. But there's times in the Bible it says don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Follow the Spirit's leading in all that you do. Because, why does it say that? Because sometimes I don't. Right? You all agree? Don't leave me up here. Right? So just because the Christian is a Christian doesn't mean they always do everything right. Just because the, the government is authorized by Christ, that doesn't mean they always do everything right. So when the government insists that you do things contrary to what this says, we don't do that. Okay? So just by example, Daniel chapter 3. So Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king. So if you, if you listen to the Bible, and you, the Bible is true and right, which it is, that's a good place for an amen, amen, then that means that Nebuchadnezzar was only in his position because God put him there. Now, if you do some real research deep, you're going to know, like, even though he was wicked and terrible, actually God specifically even said in his case, I'm bringing this guy. So God brought this guy, and he was terrible. And he told these three Jewish dudes who were just trying to do this, you will not do this. You will only bow to my golden statue or else. So if we're supposed to obey the government authorities, they should have obeyed, right? Should have. But they didn't. They said, no, 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 no. Government only goes so far. You will not tell me not to do what this says. I'm going to do what this says. And the king threw them into an oven to cook them. But I don't think God was upset with them because a fourth dude showed up in the oven and it was Jesus who set them free, right? So there's that. And then in, in the book of Daniel, in chapter 6, King Darius says, no one is to worship anyone except me. And Daniel's like, well, I, I, I can't do that be, 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 because, right? So, so he says, no, 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 I'm not doing that. So he worshiped God the way God said to worship God. And what did Darius do? Threw him in a lion's den. But God honored that as well. He came out untouched. God protected him. We go over to the New Testament. Things change, right? No, they don't. In Acts chapter 4, what happens? The church is just beginning and they're preaching Jesus. And they get arrested. By the authorities, put in place by God, right? And they said, you need to stop preaching Jesus. And they're like, well, who are we supposed to obey, God or man? And so immediately they left and preached Jesus. But did they submit to the governing authorities? Of course not. Not when it tells you, do this. This is your ultimate authority, not the government. Acts chapter 5, same thing again. They're preaching Jesus. The same people, they get arrested again. And they're told, do not preach Jesus. So what happens? An angel of the Lord shows up and releases them from jail, opens the doors wide and says, listen, I know the government told you not to, but it, you can read it in Acts chapter 5. It's, the angel of the Lord specifically said, now go preach the message of life disobeyed the government in this case still don't take your chariot over 55 miles an hour but in this case obey me obey me in acts chapter 16 yet again paul and silas are preaching jesus and the government arrests them and they said and they said listen we're gonna beat you with wooden rods for preaching jesus so they beat them with wooden rods they, they throw him in jail, and then what does God do? He causes an earthquake to come so they can be released from that jail so they can go preach Jesus again. So listen, loved ones. 
there has to come a time, part of the sudden and momentous shift in the status quo, is there needs to be a church that doesn't just put scripture verses on their coffee cups and bumper stickers, but they start to actually live what it says. You have to live what it says, right? He said, don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word, lest you deceive yourself. Let me ask you a question. If the government, if all government is appointed by God, then you have to understand that all governments in all nations are the same, right? America is not the only country in the world. You know that? Even though we think we are, right? Did you know that everyone hates China right now, right? Do you know? I don't. But you know that their government still, like the Bible still takes precedence over them. Like it's universe, it's everybody, right? So, so the government there, do you know that they're just one of many nations that say that Christianity is illegal? But you can't have a Bible. And you can't gather for worship. That's what the government says. Are we supposed to obey that? Well, well, why? But whoa, 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 whoa. You're supposed to keep the law of the land. Until, right? Until. See, here's the thing. If the government came, this is where I have an issue. If the government said, if they start to, to oppress your freedoms, don't we have... This, what is it, the se- what's the one with the guns, Second Amendment? We have a Second Amendment thing to have guns, right? Well, why do we have that if, if nothing else other, I know we can hunt and all that kind of stuff, but isn't there something about that if, if the government gets too oppressive that we can rise up? So, 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 so listen, Christians, if the government takes away your freedoms, you can rise up and disobey them. But if they say they take away your religious freedoms, we're supposed to lay over? Why? It's okay to rebel against the government when you infringe upon me. Don't take my gun. But you can take my Jesus. That's no problem. But this is what's going on, man. This is what's going on. Listen, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, do not forsake the assembling together. Do not neglect gathering together, but to encourage one another, especially now since the time of Christ's return is near. What does that mean? It means that the life that we're living right here, right now, our 70, 80 years, it's not that important. Christ is coming. Get right. right. That's the most important thing. Eternal life. Remember, don't think, don't fix your thoughts, your mind on the things of this world, but fix your eyes on the realities of heaven where Christ sits at the right hand of the Father. We're supposed to be here to proclaim the gospel boldly, not shut the doors so nobody can hear it. The Bible says that we're not supposed to close the door to the sick. We're supposed to swing them wide open. If anyone's sick among you, let them call upon the elders of the church. Let them anoint you with oil and pray for you so that you can be healed. Not close the doors. And look, where is everybody? At home, like cowards, fearful. I need to get more toilet paper. No, you need to get more Jesus. Right? Because when you, when, you, when you have Christ inside of you, it's the hope of glory. You don't care. Death, where is your sting? Right? I'm not, listen, I'm not, I'm not going to go over and lick Paula's face and, and, and beg for corona. Right? Did you notice we didn't do a meet and greet? We're not stupid. We're not ignorant living under rocks. But that doesn't mean you don't gather. The Bible says to gather. And listen, this is so funny. We're doing it on live stream. I'm not ripping. I love my Christian brothers and sisters, pastors that are awesome. Everyone should do what they think is right. It's fine. But don't tell me that sitting at home on, in your pajamas with your phone in front of your face is gathering together with other believers. Listen, on Thursday night, when millions of Americans sat in their PJs on their couch watching Seinfeld, were they somehow all together? So why all of a sudden, because we're watching some preacher, that means we're all together? Is the church, is the church in its entirety, in its fullness, all about this that's happening right now, me talking to you? No. We're supposed to encourage one another, right? We're supposed to break bread together. We're supposed to pray for one another. We're supposed to sing to the Lord together. All of those things. How do you do that when you're sitting at home in your pajamas with your smartphone on your lap. That's not church. 
And this cancer that has permeated, our, our, especially our nation, of well, you don't need to go to church to be a Christian. No, you don't, but Christians go to church. It says it in the Bible. When are we going to stop throwing away the Bible for our own comfort? Well, I think it's okay to watch. Listen, you don't need to sit at home and watch me. You can watch way better preachers on YouTube. There's John Piper, John MacArthur, uh, Francis Chan, uh, Matt Chandler. There's way better dudes than me that can preach and give you gold nuggets. But that's not what church... Church is not about a message. This is just one thing. After we get done here, we're going to go out there. We're going to eat. We're going to pray together. We're going to break bread together. We're going to sit, hopefully, to, with each other and encourage one another. Maybe pray for the person you're sitting with. Amen. Ask them how their kids are doing. Amen. Offer some help. Amen. Just encourage them with the word. Hey, man, you look great today, man. You're looking sharp, Billy Ray. Keep it up. I mean, that's what we're supposed to be doing. You can't do that at home by yourself. So we don't forsake the gathering. Because in a kingdom, the king decides how things are going to go. You and I don't. Okay? You and I do not. So all that to say, I want to preach our last message in this series called The Kingdom. And today's message if you're going to title it, would be God's love is unconditional, but God's kingdom is not. Okay? It is not. Now, last week, I briefly mentioned Romans 5.8. And I want to go back there again, because everyone who's sitting here right now, who's listening, or anyone who may be watching online, and if, listen, Dino, I think you're watching. I love you. I miss you. And what I should have done is grab one of them red velvet donuts and brought it right up here and let you watch me eat it. But I don't want to cause another brother to stumble. So, just love you. But no matter who you are, no matter where you are, I want you to know this. God's love is unconditional. It's unconditional. It's amazing. See, to get right with God, you ever hear people say, that? you better get right with God. Do you ever have anybody tell you that? You better get right with God. You ever tell anybody that? You better get right with God, right? So we all get to get right with God. I get that. But to get right with God, you have to realize that you don't have to convince God of anything. You, you, don't, you don't need to try and have him change his mind, like to try to sell him like some car salesman and change his perspective and have him change his mind on something. You don't have to sell him on how good you've been. Because you and I and all of us, every person on earth who's ever lived or ever will, is starting from a place of approval. Romans 5.8 says that God showed his great love by sending Christ to die for you while you were a sinner. Right? So what this means is he's actually just, when he sends Jesus, he's just displaying what already was. You see? He already loved you, and that's why he sent his son. So while you did, fill in the blank. No, 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 no. While you did, yeah, let's name those suckers off, right? While you did this, God said, I love you. You don't need to do this or stop doing that and then somehow God will approve and love you. All prerequisites to God's love have been abolished. They don't exist. And this is why his thoughts and his ways are not like our thoughts and our ways because I don't know about you, I'm looking at people and I'm thinking, yeah, not so awesome. You know? When I go on Facebook and I see people telling me I'm damned to hell, I should go there and die, and I'm possessed. Like, these are Christians, not just people. These are Christians condemning me to hell. You know, in that moment when I'm reading that, I'm thinking, yeah, they're not so awesome. And it makes it very difficult for me to love that person who's telling me I want you to go to hell. But God says something different. 
When, 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 when we're lying and cheating and stealing and sneaky and selfish and rude and unreliable and, and we're cursing him. He's like, yeah, I love you. That's crazy, right? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Dino, this is Karen's fault. It's not mine. I wouldn't do that to you. <clears throat> So here's my opinion on it, and again, this is, this is the Bible, and this is my opinion. My opinion, this love that God has, this unconditional love, I personally just think that it's, God is just super impressed with his own work. I think that we do some creepy, crappy stuff, myself included, but we are a pretty awesome race. Like, have you ever picked up the hood of a car and looked at that thing in there? Someone made that. That's pretty incredible, right? Did you ever think about that? Dude, someone made this. Right? A human made. Hmm. Hold on. That is so good. I know. I only took two bites. We're a pretty incredible race. We do cure diseases. We invent cool stuff. Whose phone talks to them? Right? It's crazy, right? We're capable of showing love and charity. We have the ability to think and to reason. We can do algebra, not me. <laughs> we create incredible art, beautiful things, right? Songs. Do you hear these people singing? Like incredible music. I think God is just super in love with the greatest work of his own hands. I think that's what it is. I don't know so much about our attitude and our disposition that it makes him so thrilled, but just who we are as a people. You know, we're made in God's image to be like him. And nothing in all of creation, nothing in all of the universe can make that claim except us. So I think that's why God is so in love with the human race. I think he sees a bit of himself in us. Maybe not the way you treat your spouse or your friend or your neighbor, but I think he sees a bit of, a, of himself in us. And his love is unconditional because of that. It's not because of what you do. Now the Bible actually speaks very clearly and to the point on this in Romans chapter 8. And I would like for you to turn your attention there because I think it's super important that you See these words from God spoken to you. Romans 8, verses 38 and 39 say this. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, here's the blanket statement, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So th listen, if you look at the list that he gives, he's saying, listen, no, no thing, no person, no circumstance, nothing could ever change the love that God has for you. And he proved that, that even though all those nasty things exist, he sends Jesus anyway. Nothing can separate us 
from God's love. Say, God loves me. Say it again. I see someone who didn't say it. Just say it. Yeah. Doesn't that feel good? You've got a daddy who loves you. God's love is unconditional. Yes, for sure. That's true, right? But, listen, loved ones, don't let his love lull you to sleep. And what I mean by that is that God loves you whether you're in his kingdom or not. Do you see? So listen, so that means that love, God's love for you is not the single prerequisite for entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Okay? If you are the absolute worst sinner, blatant rebellion against God, and, I, and just say, I hate God, I hate Jesus, I hate the Holy Spirit, I never will bow a knee to I'm going to do everything wrong. Listen, is God happy with that? Well, of course not. But does he love that person? Absolutely. The worst criminal on death row right now. The worst, the worst murderer, Hitler, Osama bin Laden, awful, terrible things that they did, but, but nothing can separate the love of God for that person. He loves that, and it breaks his heart that that person would live that way and not repent and turn to him. And that he would be away from that person for all eternal. His desire is that all are saved and come to an understanding of the truth. Not a single would perish. Why? Because he loves them. He loves everyone. For God so loved the world, right? That means, how many people in this world right now? Seven billion, right? How many of them would you classify as good and nice? Not a lot. But God so loved the world, everyone in it, that he sends his son. Because he loves everyone. But God's love is not the sole requirement for kingdom residency. You have a part to play in that. And that's what I want to spend this morning talking about, okay? Let's start, let's go to, to Matthew. We've spent most of our time in Matthew during this study. We'll spend much time there again this morning, Matthew chapter 18. Now Matthew, this story I'm about to read with you, this is just one example that we're going to use, but that it, it, it indicates a much, much bigger issue. This is the whole you play a part thing in, the, in kingdom residency, Okay? So we're going to look at Matthew 18, verse 23 through 35. If you're there, say you're there. Okay, here we go. Therefore, now this is Jesus talking, our king, the sovereign king of this kingdom. And he's saying, therefore, the kingdom of heaven, my kingdom that I'm the king of, can be compared to a king who decides to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process of this, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. And he couldn't pay. Get it, right? Get it. You know, the Bible says that your sin deserves death, and there's nothing you can do to pay for that. So this story is very apropos, isn't it? So this this person owes a debt that he cannot pay. And so what does the master say? He ordered the, 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 the person, the servant, his servant, to be sold along with his wife and his children and everything he owned to pay the debt. That's what they would do back then. He owed, if you owed money, they didn't just file it to, to Equifax. They took your wife and kids and sold them into slavery to pay for that debt. That was rough, right? So he's, gonna, he's like, I want you to pay this debt. But the man fell down before his master. These words are important, guys, the servant-master thing. That shows your position. It shows your relationship, right? There's a master. There's a servant, right? They're not outside of this kingdom. This servant was part of the kingdom in this story. And the man fell, this this servant, the servant fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then the master was filled with pity for him and he didn't say, okay, I'll give you more time. What does he say? He released him and forgave his debt. Awesome. Is that you? Is that you? You had a debt you couldn't pay and God released you of the debt 
because Jesus paid it for you. Okay. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant, another member, residence of the kingdom, who owed him a few thousand dollars, so the debt wasn't as big. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. So his fellow servant fell down before him, just like he did to the king. And he begged him for a little more time, just like he did before the king. And he said the same thing that the other guy said to the king. Be patient with me and I'll repay it. He pleaded. But his creditor, not like the king, his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison. Man, that's rough. So when some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. So the king called in the original guy that he had forgiven and said, you evil servant. So he's still a member of the kingdom, isn't he? Isn't he? Yeah. Okay. I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he paid his entire debt, which he can't pay. It's already been acknowledged. And watch this. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Now, with that fresh in your memory, just go back a few pages to Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. How many people believe that the Bible is true? Okay. Let me ask you a question. Do unforgiven sinners go to heaven? Do unforgiven sinners go to heaven? All agree? How do people get, what's that? No, no. How many people will be in heaven that God did not forgive of their sins? Show me. Okay, awesome. How do we get saved? Is it not? How do we gain? How do we, how do we get saved? How do we gain residence into the kingdom? Isn't it by being forgiven? Can we all agree to that? Okay. Do we get to heaven because we forgive other people? No, we do not. We get in because we get forgiven by our king. We all agree? Amen. When this happens, when we are forgiven by our king, King Jesus becomes your savior. Do you agree to that? Amen. Okay. So when you see here in, in our story that the man begged for time and the compassion and, and pity of God says, you know what, I'll just waive the debt. That's Savior. You just saved my hide, right? But now in a master-servant relationship, there is expectation. And this is called lordship, right? What the king says goes or else. So just let Jesus shape your belief system. Don't let denomination bent or tradition or mom or dad or whatever, shape it for you. The servant was forgiven, but due to his disobedience afterwards, the verdict changed. Now that is so unpopular in church. But you can't deny this one thing. You just read that. Amen. I didn't make anything up. I don't care what version you have. Because I know that there's a big dude right there with the King James, and the, there might not be as many hither and froze, but it says the same thing. Okay? And there's another King James right there. It says the same thing. I forgive you, and then you didn't forgive. I don't forgive you. And if you don't forgive, I won't forgive you, he says. 
My Father will not forgive you if you don't forgive other people. And how many unforgiven sinners go to heaven? None. We have a, we have a role to play in the kingdom of heaven. This truth is repeated there in chapter 6, right? The cross offers forgiveness. Jesus is the payment for your sin. But if you don't forgive after this, then my Father won't forgive you. And that is not a salvation issue because it's not your, you forgiving each other that causes you to go to heaven. It's Jesus forgiving you, and then in response to that, I must in turn forgive you when you sin against me, or else the Father goes, forget what I said, you're done. I mean, it just says it. It just says it, and this is not popular. But he's preaching a kingdom. And in the kingdom, what the king says goes, goes. <clears throat> this forgiveness that king jesus is talking about we we can't deny what it says right How, this doesn't get preached in churches but we can't deny what jesus said and if jesus then we can't just sweep what he says under the rug because he's the single sovereign monarch this is post forgiveness this is post salvation this is post-cross. After you've been forgiven, you must forgive or else. And this is only one issue that I bring to the table this morning, but it introduces us to the reality of Christ's lordship. In the kingdom, we have to do as the king says, right? And, and listen, this forgiveness that he speaks of, this lordship that we must submit ourselves to this is an ongoing never-ending choice to follow the king in willful obedience it's not a one-time thing it's an always thing all the time for the rest of your life okay now i want to turn your attention now to two verses that will change everything everything please look at matthew 7:21. You're there? Okay. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. you know that? That's what it says. That's what it says. Let me ask you a question. Can someone who hates Jesus utter the words, Jesus is Lord? Sure. Sure they can. So people could say Jesus is Lord all day long, but as our buddy Joyce Meyer said, you can hang out in a garage all day, it doesn't make you a car. So you can call Jesus Lord all day, that doesn't mean that he is, because look here, Jesus says this, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That should make your knees buckle. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. Now, now let me ask you this. How many people pre-salvation, before you got saved, were doing what God wanted them to do? Raise your hand if you were doing what God wanted you to do. Right. So what God wanted you to do only happens before or after? After. So not all people that call on me and say, Lord, Lord, are actually going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do the will of the Father. This is post-cross, is it not? Because the stuff before, no one was doing the will of the Father before he got saved. I know I wasn't. This is post-cross. This is post-salvation. This is post-forgiveness. This is post the mercy of God waiving your debt. That only those who then, after saying, yes, Jesus, I need you, then lordship of Christ. Only those who do what God says to do will enter the kingdom of heaven. I mean, you're just reading it right there, right? You're reading it right there. Um, jump over to Luke 6.46. I think I've made up my mind. I don't... I think I have... 
Some people have asked me when I was going to write my next book. And I, I think I'm going to. I think I'm going to call it How to Grow Your Church in Half. <laughs> just preach the Bible. This is what happens. Am I just reading the Bible to you this morning? Who wants to hear all this? Nobody. Nobody. I mean, nobody really. Let's be honest, right? But, I mean, doesn't the Bible say that in the last days this is what's going to happen? People are going to gather around, gather teachers to themselves that will tell them what they want to hear, tickle their ears. That's what Paul said to Timothy, right? That's what's going to happen. But you, Timothy, I just take that on myself too. You, Moses, I plead with you before God and Christ Jesus will come day, someday come to judge the living and the dead to preach the word. In season and out, to teach your people the word. Patiently encourage, rebuke, and correct them with good teaching. So I'm just reading the Bible to you, right? Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to hear that. It, it really disrupts our comfort. And I get that. So Luke 6, 46, look at this says here. Why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? Yeah, Jesus offered forgiveness on the cross. That makes him what? Savior, right? But Jesus also commands obedience. That's Lord, right? Why do you call me Lord if you're not doing what I say? Do you ever wonder why Jesus says that the road to life, the gate is narrow and the road is difficult and very few find it? Tons of people say yes to Jesus to save their hide on the cross, but very few, as he's saying, don't even do what I say. You can't have Jesus as Savior and not as Lord. You can't have Jesus as Lord. Like, I know people that will follow the golden rule. Do unto others as you want done to you. Like, that's super nice. They give to charity. They help the poor. Does that get you in? No. no. Is it good? Should we do it? Yeah. We should be doing it more than anyone. Our offering baskets should be pouring over so we could help the world. I, I get that. So we should do good. But that doesn't get you in. Because you could, be, you could be under the lordship of Jesus and doing all that it says to do, but if you've never asked him to be your savior, you get nothing. See, you can't divide Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I think it says, it says, has Jesus been, Jesus been divided into factions? You can't divide Jesus, right? In Acts chapter 2, verse 36, it says that Christ is both Lord and and Messiah. Messiah and Savior is the same word. He's both, right? So you can't get a little bit of Jesus over here, this kind of, I want some Savior Jesus, but I don't want to have any Lordship Jesus. I don't want to be, I want a little bit of Lordship Jesus, but I don't want any of that Savior Jesus. I can get there on my own because I'm doing all the things he says to do. I'm a good guy. I get to get in. No, you don't. Doesn't work that way, right? Jesus is Lord and Messiah. That's who he is in his entirety. And you either say yes to all of that or you don't say yes to any of that. Right? Don't be lukewarm. Get off the fence. Don't beat around the bush or I'll spit you out of my mouth. I mean, that's what he says. This cannot be ignored. And ignoring the reality of the scripture that I just read with you Ignoring it causes this. It causes complacency. It causes lethargy in the body of Christ because we think we're good and we're not. Right? You, 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 have, to, you have to pursue him with your whole heart. But someone who doesn't embrace that Jesus is both Lord and Savior will not pursue God with their whole heart because they don't think they need to. And that's a problem. And, and heaven forbid you stand before him and say, Lord, I want in. And he goes, who are you? Go away from me, those who disobey God's laws. I don't want that for anyone in this church. No one that God has entrusted to me to care for your soul. I never want that day to happen to you. I want you to, I want the, 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 I want everyone in heaven to roll out the red carpet because Nancy's coming. 
That's what I want. Right? I don't want to go going through the list. I don't see no Nancy up in here. Who's Nancy? Who is this? I want that. Right? So that's why I'm telling you. The gate is narrow. The road is difficult. Very few find it. Why do you call me Lord? You won't do what I say. This complacency and lethargy in the body of Christ. And that's why you will see, like what you're seeing right now online, when they just make up their own hybrid Christianity, doing whatever they want to do. Well, I don't have to do this, and I don't have to do that. Do you realize that it says in the Bible you're supposed to do this? Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. No, 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 no. I fear for that. I fear for those people that are they're thinking that they're, they're following Christianity when they don't even understand what it says. I had a person that I love at the first church I ever went to. When I got saved there, I, I cherished those moments. Those memories are incredible. And I'm voicing on the internet about how Hebrews 10.25 says, Do not forsake the assembling together. There's no asterisk that says, in case, but not unless there's corona. And they actually wrote, you know, we don't always have to take God's word literally. What? <laughs> and, and it's rampant. You don't have to gather. You can do it in your house. You can do this. You can do that. You can do it in your hunting stand. You can do it on your bass boat. You can go into your secret place. Yeah, I know that. But it doesn't negate the fact that God's word says don't neglect the gathering. You don't get to make up your own stuff. There's no room for that in the church. And I fear for people who make up their own Christianity because if you're not following him as Lord, are you saved? I don't know. I don't want to make that decision. It's not up to me. But I just wonder. But this type of attitude towards Jesus as common, making up our own stuff, ignoring these realities of the lordship of Christ, it breeds complacency, and lethargy. I just can't help but think that if we embraced him both as Lord and Messiah and actually did what he wanted us to do all the time, if people truly understand that obedience is necessary to be in the kingdom of heaven, do you think evangelism would increase? Oh, yeah, you better believe it. Do you think generosity would increase? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you think there'd be an increase in wells being dug in, in little drought-laden villages all over Africa and India because we funded it with our offering? Do you think that would happen more if people actually took seriously the lordship of Jesus? Absolutely. Do you know how much it costs to dig a well that would last 10 years in a, in a village of about 100 people in Africa? Do you know how much it would cost? Five grand. I guarantee someone has that in their pocket right now. Right now. I don't either. I guarantee you that they do, though. Do you think we'd be more forgiving and kind? Do you think poverty would decrease? Do you think sex trafficking would decrease? Just bring it down to our local right here. What do you think our prayer night would look like here? Do you think we'd have seven or eight people in here? Do you think it would be packed out in this place? What would our world look like if Christians actually took the words of Jesus Christ seriously when in Matthew 16, 24, he said this, if, that's a big word, if any of you want to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross. You know what that means? That means be willing to sacrifice and suffer just like I did to advance my kingdom. If any, if, 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 if any of you want to be my follower, you, what's the word he uses? Must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross and follow me. Lots of people say Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Lots of people say that I'm a Christian. Lots of people say I'm saved. But a glance at the patterns of their life might say something a little bit different. Maybe one day you walk the aisle, you're at a church, pastor gave the call to repentance and faith, and you said yes. 
You walk down that aisle, you raise your hand, you filled out the card, whatever it is, whatever prayer you made. Maybe you did that. And you said, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. But the patterns of your life never changed. You were still the same person when you left than when you got there. Maybe nothing in your life was what the Bible would say to show deeds in accordance with repentance. Maybe that never happened. Or perhaps there was a prolonged season of willful, faithful submission to the Lordship of Christ in your life. You claimed the Lord. You obeyed the Lord. But things changed, as they often do. And perhaps the patterns of your life changed a bit. Well, I think that 1 Corinthians chapter 6 talks pretty clearly about this. Don't you realize, uh, 6, 9, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? And before you jump on that sentence, let's let that, let's explain all that. Here comes a little bit of a list. Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or abusive or cheat people, None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Has anyone ever stolen anything in their life? Raise your hand if you've stolen anything. Does that make you a thief? What if you steal and steal and steal and steal? (laughs) That makes you what? A thief. Anyone ever in this room ever been greedy? Raise your hand. Does that make you a greedy person? What happens if you're greedy once, greedy twice, greedy 465 times, greedy 4,000, and right, unrepenting, not caring, don't stopping, keep on doing it, that's the pattern of my life. That makes you a greedy person, doesn't it? Anybody ever cheat on a spouse or a boyfriend or girlfriend or anything? Yeah, come on. I'm, I'm little, little you angels. Right? I admit it. But does that make me an adulterer? Or did I commit adultery? Right. Anyone would ever have parties back when they were high school and you try to get the girls drunk enough where they would start making out? I mean, just being honest. Right? Honest, right? All the time. Right? So, so, so li- listen. Real life here. Real life. So, so listen, so if I, if, I, if I get the two girls drunk and they kiss, that one time, does that make them homosexual? Did they do something wrong? Yeah. yeah. But does that make them homosexual? What if they just keep kissing and they don't stop and they just, that's what they do forever? They don't stop. That's practicing homosexuality. You see, you see what happens here. So we're talking about patterns of life that need to change when we say yes to Jesus. And we have to say yes to Jesus. That doesn't mean just saying yes to him as Savior. That means saying yes to him as Lord, which means he's saying if you do this stuff, you don't get in. So you can't say, well, I'm a Christian, but I'm practicing homosexuality. I'm a Christian, but I'm doing drugs repetitively. I'm a Christian, but I'm greedy all the time. I'm a Christian, but I'm this. I'm a Christian, but. I'm a Christian, but. I'm a Christian, but. You don't get to but. You just don't get to but. Again, the gate is narrow. The road is difficult. Very few find it. Because this list that I'm reading right here, this is just a short list. Could the list be a lot longer? Oh, you bet. But this short list almost embraces everyone in our room. Unless you turn from it. There are tons of people that believe Jesus is God, intellectually. There are tons of people that believe that he died on the cross for them. And they'll ask him for forgiveness and salvation, but they don't obey him. And he says, why do you call me Lord when you won't do what I say? Right? Not perfect. There's grace there. Right? We all fail in many ways, the Bible says. Every day we all fail. There's grace there. 
But you can't just be like, yeah, I stumbled, and I don't care, and I'm going to keep doing it, even though you say not to. Can't wait to go to heaven. It will not work that way. It doesn't work that way, right? We're talking about patterns. We're talking about identity as a greedy person, not someone who, who exercised their right to be greedy one day. We're talking about a greedy person, a person who is a swindler, a person who is a cheater, right? Not someone who cheated, someone who's a cheater. Patterns of life, right? One theft does not make you a thief. So maybe I never changed when I came to the altar. Or perhaps there was a prolonged season of lordship in my life, but I fell into some sinful patterns of willful disobedience. Well, what does the Bible say about all of that? And I would ask you to turn to John chapter 15. I don't normally jump all over the Bible because I usually preach through books of the Bible, but this is a topic of the Bible, and so this topic is spoken of all over the Bible, so we're examining the whole Bible to see what it says about the topic. So that's why we're jumping all over. I don't like doing that, but on a topical thing, that's what we do. So John 15, the first six verses, I want to read, I'm going to read it actually out of the um, Holman Christian Standard Version. I just think that it's a much better translation in this section of Scripture. So I want you to use a little bit of your imagination, your mind's eye, as God's word is proclaimed. This is Jesus speaking, and he says, I am the true vine. So picture a vine coming out of the ground. Do you see it? Do you see it? Do you see it? My father is the vineyard keeper, so he's like the gardener. Do you see that? Now, we have to include ourselves in this. We need to know where we are. So just for a quick second, just look down at verse 5. I am the vine, he reminds us again, and you are the branches. Okay, so where the players in the play are this. Jesus is the vine. We're the branches coming off the vine. And God the Father is the gardener. He's the one who decides trimming and uprooting. You know, he's the gardener of a garden. Okay, do you all see it there? Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. Here we go. I am the true vine. You're the branches. My father is the vineyard keeper. Every branch in me. Every branch in me. I'm reminded of another verse in scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has died. Behold the new man or new woman. Okay, what is that all saying? Anyone's in Christ, they're saved, right? To be saved means you're in Christ. So let's go back to the story here for a second. I'm the vine, you're the branches, the Father is the gardener, every branch in me. Can you, can you be in him and not be saved? No. We're, we're talking about branches that are in Christ. In Christ. Okay, listen. Every branch... In me that does not produce fruit, he, who's he? The father, the gardener, removes. He removes the branch from the vine. And he prunes every branch that does produce fruit. So it'll produce more. Now, what does that mean? He doesn't cut you off. If, you're, if, the, if the character of Christ is being developed in you, and the expansion of his kingdom is happening through you. Not that much, but it's happening. He's pleased with that. That's good. So let me cut away some of the things in your life that might be getting in the way of you producing more fruit for me. So he's not cutting you off the, brand, off the vine. He's just taking away some of the... Anyone ever grow a tomato plant? Suckers. You know what a sucker is, right? The little thing that comes up between the shoots. In the V, that, that, that never produces any tomatoes, but it sucks nutrients from the plant so it can't produce tomatoes. So what do you do? You pluck it off. Does it kill the plant? No. It actually produces more fruit as a result. So that's what he's saying here. If you're producing fruit, if things are happening, you're becoming more like Christ, more compassion, more love, more forgiveness, right? More evangelism, spreading the kingdom, more generosity, more prayer, more everything. Awesome. But there's still some things in your life that are getting in the way of 
totally awesome. Let's get rid of that stuff. So God will do that to you. Did you ever take anything away from you that got in the way? Yeah. Amen, right? He removes those that do not produce fruit that are in him. And he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You're already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Listen to this. Remain in me and I in you just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine. So neither can you unless you remain in me. Now, let me ask you guys a question for those who would say, well, once you're saved, you're always saved. Why would he tell you to remain in him if you have no opportunity to not? Why would he say to abide or remain in him if once you get saved, you're so, you're so changed at the molecular level that you cannot be cut off, that you cannot? You know what that means? That means you go up to your wife and you say, um, honey, can we go back to that restaurant we never went to? Who would say such a stupid thing? Because they'll say, well, he was never saved. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. He said, abide. He said, remain. Why is he telling you to remain if the option to not doesn't exist? Remain means to stay where you already are. And he's telling you to stay there. If there was no threat of being removed from that spot, would he tell you to remain there? Would he tell you to produce fruit unless so that my father won't cut you off? I mean, just, you might not like this, but you're reading it. He says, I am the vine, you're the branches. The one who remains in me, so that means there's some that were in him and will not, but the one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you could do nothing without me. If anyone does not remain in me, this is the scary part. So if you get cut off, that person is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them, throw them into the fire, and they are burned. So perhaps there was a season of life where you were obedient to the Lord. You bowed to him. You obeyed him. You followed him. But then something changed. The kingdom isn't unconditional by any stretch of the imagination. Obedience to the king is commanded. But if you find yourself hearing these words that I'm preaching to you right now, if you find yourself feeling hopeless and separated from God due to a sinful pattern, that's awesome. Because God has an answer for that. It's 1 John 1 9. If you will confess your sin to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you of all wickedness. So, no matter how far into that pattern you've gotten, and I'm talking basement down, if you're there right now, and he's not your Lord, and he would say to you, why do you call me Lord if you don't do what as I say? You can stop that right now and change that whole thing as easy as 1 John 1, 9 right now. And you can change, and you can truly do what Jesus said. Repent of your sin and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So, what I, as your pastor, as the one who's entrusted with caring for your soul, I want two things. And that's why I preach this stuff. First of all, I want you to have true assurance of your salvation. I want you to live with real assurance of salvation and residence in the kingdom of heaven based on the word of God, not on what you think or what grandma taught you. I want you to, I want you to leave this place today and absolutely without a shadow of a doubt know that if you did get this virus 
and you were to expire next week, that your next thought, your next moment of consciousness would be, there's Jesus. That's what I want for you more than anything. And second, not as important, but very, very important to me, once and for all, I want to see the impact on the world that a group of people can make when Jesus Christ and his word and his kingdom are actually treated as precious and not common. I want to see the impact that a church can make on a world where the lordship of Jesus Christ is truly embraced and lived out. I want to see the amazing results that would, would take place. I want to see the incredible impact on the world that a church that doesn't treat Jesus as common would make. And I want to see everyone in our church live with incredible purpose and fulfillment. And that purpose and fulfillment can only come by living a life worthy of the gospel. Worthy of living a life worthy of the calling you've been called to. That's what I would like to see. Not settling or, or purchasing this bag of goods that's been sold to us by common culture. Okay, Jesus is the king. And this is Jesus' kingdom. He alone is the single sovereign monarch of his kingdom. What he says goes. And I want to be the church that lives accordingly. Amen? That's what I want. And I hope that you want that as well. So listen, loved ones. Before we get done, before we sing another song, I want to just offer this to you. If you've been that person that said yes to Jesus and your life never changed. I'm talking wholesale change. I'm not saying you just don't use the I'm talking wholesale change. If that hasn't happened, I would invite you to just say no more to that. To repent of that and turn to God. Right? Just turn to God. Confess your sin to him. Just let him know. Listen, I, I said yes to you on the cross. You're my savior, but you weren't my Lord. And I don't live like that anymore. I want to live for you. I want to do what your word says. I want to be obedient to the prompting of your spirit. I want to read your word and I want to obey what it says. That's what I want to do. And so I would just say, if you've never made that decision, make it today. And at the same time, if you're that person that said yes, and there was a season, even if it was six, seven, eight, ten years, twenty years, and then all of a sudden things changed, you just weren't that guy or girl anymore where you weren't really living for him. Those that are in me that are not producing fruit, I cut them off and throw them into the fire to be burned. This is serious business, y'all. But by no means will Jesus turn away anyone who turns to him. It doesn't make any difference how nasty, in the basement, in the gutter, filthy, raunchy, sinful pattern you're in right now. You might be sleeping around with someone else's spouse, cheating on yours. You might be doing drugs. You might be watching porn like crazy. You might be selling illegal stuff. You might be stealing. Whatever it is that you might be doing, I don't know what you're doing. But if you are, you can stop that right now. Right now. And just confess your sin to the Lord. And say, I'm sorry, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to follow you now. And I'm done with that. He's faithful and just to forgive you of that sin and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So whether it's a pattern that's never changed or a pattern that changed and then it went sour, you can turn from that right now. And Jesus will welcome you into his kingdom with open arms. Amen? Amen. Right. Let's pray. Father, I don't want to interfere with whatever you're doing right here, right now, and in, in your people. So I just think I just need to shut up.
this still going? Good. Father, I um, I just ask for your mercy upon your people. Sometimes your word encourages us. Sometimes it corrects us. Sometimes it rebukes us. And I don't know, Lord, where everyone is on that scale this morning, whether here or watching online, but we're just grateful that your word is true. We're grateful that that you speak to all of us, that we're not alone. We're thankful, Lord, that you give us hope, that even though we may be trapped in a cycle of sin that is just destroying ourselves, that you reach down from heaven and offer us a lifeline. Thank you for the truth of 1 John 1, 9. Thank you, Lord, that when we confess our sin to you, when we admit where we have been wrong, that you are so faithful to forgive. Just reminded, Lord, of the first section of Scripture that we shared, that you're so faithful to forgive us, yet we're so unfaithful to forgive others. Help us with that. We never want to negate your grace by not forgiving others. We don't want to be the unforgiving debtor who is forgiven so much, yet never offered forgiveness to anyone else. So, Lord, I I know that uh, as I'm standing here, Lord, there's, you know, there's all these thoughts going on in my mind of the people that have just absolutely shredded me online for doing what you've told us to do in your word. And I have to admit, I've gotten a little fired up. This helped me to forgive them and love them, just like you do. I know you love them. I want to as well. So loved ones, um, Many people that have been online today are saying that we are only doing this not to honor God, but to pat our pockets and get your offering. But I, I believe I speak for Herb as well, or other elder. If, if I'm not speaking correctly, please, Herb, disrupt me and it's fine. We don't want this church to ever, ever, ever not only to be about money, but to even be perceived to be anything wicked like that. So, we're not going to take an offering. Now, we also understand that the Bible does tell us that we're to bring our tithes and offerings to the storehouse. So, I'm not going to tell someone you cannot give. Like, I would never go against God like that, because then I'm just as bad as anybody else who's doing it, right? So I'm never going to do that. So I'm not going to tell you you can't give. But we're not going to take an offering. The baskets aren't going around the room. We're not doing it. Because what we really want is we want the world to understand that what we're doing here at Revolution is truly what we do and what he says to do only. And that's the only reason why we're here. And we're trusting in the Lord and his provision to provide for this ministry so it can go forth with impact and that he will take care of all that we need. He says, if we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all that we need shall be added. So we believe that God will provide for this church and its mission, even though we're not taking an offering today. And we're in financially in no position not to take an offering but we're not taking one. Because we want everyone to know that we are here to honor Jesus and to obey his word only. That's who Revolution Church is. That's who Revolution Church has always been, and that's who Revolution Church will always be. Amen? All right. Now listen, loved ones. 
you love Jesus? Remember when we first started this morning and we, we sang that song, Would You Meet Me Here Again? That if you move close to him, he moves close to you. Do you remember that? Amen. Did he move close to you? Did you hear his voice speak to you today? If you heard him speak to you personally, raise your hand. Did God speak to you? Awesome, right? He is so faithful. He is so faithful, right? Awesome. So, so listen, let's just... Let's just take the next, I think it's like 10 minutes. Let's just sing. This is a, an older song that's been redone. It's a beautiful song. A song about how you called, you did, I did. You called to him and he came to your rescue and saved you. Come on, let's get to our feet and let's sing that together.